All right, buddy. Go ahead and join group on me. You're going to walk up to my backpack. You're going to interact other. Right. I Perfect. And go ahead and go uh, go green. Perfect. All right. All right, Max. Well, welcome to the AIT day one and two. Uh, this is Second Lieutenant Sherwood. I'm actually going to be recording this tonight, so we can put it on the YouTube channel for other guys to watch before they attend the AIT training program. Uh, we're going to be running through a few items. Uh, the key with the AIT is that you're I'm going to go over a lot of concepts very fast. Um, if you're confused at any point, if you get lost, uh, feel free to just interrupt me and let me know that you're, you know, you need have a question on something or you know you you need more clarification on why something is done a certain way. Now, with our training program for AIT, we are not just telling you what to do; we are telling you why to do it and why we use it and why your team leaders are taking a certain action as well. So you understand not just it from a physical standpoint what you need to be doing, but also from a logical standpoint why it's being done. So if at any point you don't understand both the physical and the logical side, uh, please, please ask and we'll, we'll get through it as quickly as we can. Now the first and foremost, you're going to need to know your basic unit spacing. So with unit spacing in the 91st, the basic spacing that you're going to need to use is here down with the yellow markers. So if you go ahead and take a stand over on one of those. This is basic unit spacing, so one of those yellow markers apart. So you're going to need to understand that that's about half of the first shack tack. Do you have the shack tack uh, compass down in the bottom center? Do you know what I mean by that, Max? The is there a gr like gray circles down in the center of the screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the shack tack. So yeah, on the shack tack, and I'll talk over radio so you can get me here. Um, on the shack tack actual menu, you'll see about half of the first circle is the basic spacing. Now if we call for tight spacing, guess what? It's going to be one half of that. And so you can see this is what tight spacing looks like. And then moms would close down to the yellow dot there. Moms, can you close down a little bit? This would be tight. Now going a little bit further, if we call for double. Double spacing, wide spacing. This is what double would be. Do you see the distancing there? Got it. Now, in order to try and practice this, we're going to go ahead and do some laps around the uh, the helipad here. We're going to keep an eye on your spacing and make sure that you're able to maintain. Go ahead and follow me around as I proceed. We're going to start off at a basic jog. Use your sprint at any time in order to maintain the formation. So you can use your shack tact as a way to balance yourself and find your spot within a formation at any time. But more than that, uh, one of the key elements is going to be able to, you know, kind of adjust on the fly while looking elsewhere. And, you know, you'll build that up over time, but it is important that you're able to maintain the spacing and the formation while changing direction and shifting. And you've done a great job thus far. We'll go ahead and hold. That's exactly right. So that's basic spacing there. All right, so now we're going to start going straight into uh, formations here. So that spacing applies to all formations that we'll do within the 91st as a unit. So you're going to need to understand that that spacing is critical to you, uh, you know, maintaining formation as needed, and you will be called out if you're out of formation at any time. All right, so we're going to go ahead and proceed. Go ahead and stay with me. and go ahead and go to a column formation and stay in a column. A column and or file is what this will be called. Now work on making sure you're maintaining your distancing. Let's go ahead and hold. See you're a little bit tight. Now you'll get used to it and you'll get used to what it feels like to be the proper distance away and over time you'll start to learn it. Now with a column formation like this, uh, most formations have benefits and downsides, and we're going to go over the benefits and downsides of every different formation within the unit. So with a column like this, the number one benefit is that we have a lot of flexibility with our terrain and with our movement. Now the big downside of this formation is that directly forwards we are very weak. We only have one-fifth of the fire team's firepower directly to the front. Now with that being said, we have 100% firepower to the right and to the left side of this group. So we have the ability to put down full unit firepower, full fire team firepower to the left or to the right pretty much immediately with contact. 
Formation like this will be used when navigating through rough terrain or through terrain where the threat assessment is made to the left or to the right. Now you'll hear me reference to threat assessment a lot. Threat assessment is something that team leaders do in order to try and form their team into good formations for the situation that they're in. If the team leader believes the threat is directly forward, he is not going to advance the team in a column directly towards the threat. He's going to make sure that the sides or the biggest firepower items of the unit are facing the threat at all times, and that is part of his threat assessment. Now one of the cool things about this formation is I'm able to make adjustments and actually change pace. I can pick up the pace, I can go to double time, I can step it back, I can step it back down off double time, I can go through rough terrain, I can navigate difficult spaces and tight spaces, and it is very easy for the rest of the squad to stay up and stay with the team. It's very easy for you guys to follow. Now, again, if, say, I make my threat assessment directly to that tower off to the northeast, as a team leader, what you'll often see is the team leader will take a combat angle. So combat angles are things that team leaders will do with a column formation like this in order to make sure that they have a base of fire that can be brought to bear towards a threat at any given time. So with that, we have the ability right now to angle ourselves and engage this tower if needed. Now, if at any point you think, okay, our team leader is leading us off on a wild goose chase, you know for a fact the objective is directly to the northeast. That's where the HVT is being kept. Why is the team leader taking you directly to the north? That's very likely always going to be because he is taking a combat angle and there's a strategic reason behind it. Whether it's due to the threat assessment that they have made, whether it's due to the location of friendlies or anything else, there is a reason behind it and always trust your team leader to be making a good call on that stuff. So no, they are not always lost, and I know I am not always lost, despite being a second lieutenant. Next formation that we're going to go ahead and cover is going to be a wedge formation. Moms, if you can cut over and make it into a wedge. Wedge formation is squared off uh, between what we'll cover later, which is a firing line, and a column formation. Now, wedge formation has a few benefits from both. What a wedge does, it allows you to have a good 50-50 firepower split to the right and to the left at 45 degree angles. Now with that firepower split, we're able to bring fire to bear very quickly and set up and engage contacts. But again, with something like this is when you do not know exactly where the threat is coming from. Where your threat assessment tells you, okay, there's enemies somewhere spread from the northwest to north, you know, southeast, and they're all the way spread, maybe even at a full, you know, 270 angle. You don't know where the enemy is going to come from, and so a wedge formation is used because it gives you the most protection and mobility mixed when in reasonably open terrain. Now with a wedge formation, I can still make adjustments and I can make heading changes, but the downside of a heading change is, go ahead and freeze, the downside of a heading change on a wedge formation is as I make a turn like that, you on the right hand side have to cut down your pace a bit, and moms on the left hand side has to increase his pace. Now the downside of that obviously is that you guys all as the team stepping further back and further back within this formation if we had more players, it then changes the way you guys have to actually work as a dynamic and it shifts and it takes a few more seconds to get set up. So again, the downside of this formation is it's not as mobile as a regular, you know, as a regular line formation or excuse me, as a as much as a regular column formation. You don't have as much freedom as of movement. But you can still make heading adjustments, and with something like this, the team leader will generally call out the heading adjustments. They'll call out that you're moving on a 110 or something of the like. Now, the next formation we'll jump straight into is going to be a line formation, a firing line. Go ahead and set it up on me. Increase spacing. There you go. A little more. You got more than that. Much better. All right. And we looks like we've added one more here. So with that being said, a line formation has a lot of benefits and a lot of downsides. A line formation is nearly impossible to maintain while moving. It's almost impossible to actually maintain and keep a line, especially when now all of a sudden I make a heading adjustment. It has all the downsides of a wedge with an increased downside of that you can't see me directly and it's just not ideal. The benefit of a line is when you have a hundred percent guaranteed threat or a very high probability threat assessment. If I know the enemy is on top of that water tower, the far water tower, I'm going to set up in a firing line and I'm going to advance my team in a firing line ready to engage and ready to take out that threat. Now with that being said, that water tower, if that is not 100%, I put the team into a very big risk situation here. 
Because if I'm not 100% that that is where the threat is and we get flanked, we then have one-fifth of our firepower brought to bear immediately. And that can be a very, very risky endeavor. And also more than that, crossfire for our teammates shooting over a fellow teammates or shooting around fellow teammates can get really, really dangerous. And we'd rather avoid that if possible. So again, line formation like this, firing line, great formation when you know where the target is or you know when you're going to engage or even when you're stationary and you are set up ready to fight off an enemy contact coming towards you or defense. It's fantastic when you know where the threat's coming from. But if you don't know where the threat's coming from, use a wedge. All right, any questions at this point, Max? Uh, yes. Go for it. Well, the squad leaders sometimes um, order a combination of formations, such as part of the team holds the wedge up front and the and everyone else moves up. What we'll do is all of the formations that we use within the 91st, all of the formations are fully scalable. So you have to understand that they're going to extrapolate out to, you know, squad size with two fire teams, which is a full 10-man group, uh, all the way up to platoon size, where we have the entire unit in one giant wedge. Now, again, that is not very likely, but it does happen, you know, and we'll do a, a full column with the entire platoon. And when we're moving somewhere to somewhere else or we need to because of the terrain, you know, if we get into these different situations as we address it, we will we'll do so. As far as mixed formations, not so much. You'll generally get a pretty clear call from your team leader with regards to what formation is being ran. Uh, the closest thing to a mix that you'll see is the next formation we're going to go over, which is an echelon right. So go ahead and set up echelon right, moms. Echelon right is a wedge to the right side only. Echelon left is, guess what? Wedge to the left side only. I forgot which side, your left or mine? My right. Look at, I'm the AR. Yeah. The AR stays on the base of fire side, which is going to be the left-hand side, the opposite of whatever direction I called echelon to. So if I call echelon right, AR stays left, everyone else goes right, and we stack the formation high on the right-hand side. Guess why we're doing this? It's because the threat assessment has been made to the right, and I can move a formation like this, and then generally a formation like this will be used in a circular pattern around an enemy threat, so say it's the tower up there. We'll use a formation like this in a circular pattern, maintaining the 45 directly on the target. It allows us to close the distance to the threat and engage the threat while not having uh, too much of a risk to the squad itself or to the fire team. Okay, so next we're going to go ahead and cover uh, some key items that are part of our bounding sequences. So there's two different types of bounding. Go ahead and go to a firing line on me. So with a bounding formation, or with different types of bounding, one thing that you'll notice is we, there's two major types of bounding. There's alternate bounding and successive bounding. Now alternate bounding, the way I like to think of it is you're alternating the lead man. You're alternating and you're moving ahead of them. You know, you're trading the lead position, the lead firing position. Now with successive bounding, the way I try and remember it is like a king's throne. You're succeeding them. You're taking over their firing position. You're moving to them and then moving and like keeping their firing position itself. Now with that, we're going to split off into two teams. It's going to be moms and I, and then you and JDAM, Max. So bounding teams will be split by your team leader in the middle of a firefight. Bounding teams are going to be going like such, and this is not live fire, so everybody hold fire. Um, in a successive bound, the team leader will call out successive bounding, towards the northeast five second bounds five second bound is your sprint distance so moms and i are going to go ahead and initiate a successive bound it's going to go and we're going to call out over the radio that team one is set and then you're going to call out team two moving team two moving and then because it's successive you're going to succeed us you're going to move to our position our current throne you're going to sit down and you're going to call out set set Team two. Team, team one moving. Team two one moving. Team one set. Team one set. Team two's moving. Team two set. Team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving.
Team two set. Team two set. Moving. All right, about face and reform firing line on me. So you have the idea with successive. So now we're going to try alternate. And I'm going to go ahead and do another five second bound this time towards the southwest with alternate bounding this time. Now moms and I are going to go ahead and bound another five seconds. Now the key with this one is now we are set. Now I'm going to have you bound, but you're going to bound five seconds past our position. So you're going to bound a total of 10 seconds. But you have to think of it as bounding five seconds past my position. So go ahead and initiate the bound. Team, team one set. Team, team moving. Team two Team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving. Team two set. Team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving. Go ahead and freeze. Now something I want to bring and highlight here is bound distances, even though the team leader set it at 5 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever they set it at, that is not a hard number. If you get engaged or you come under fire and there's good cover right where you're at at that exact second, bound to the covered position and don't bound extra far forward. And You have to use your judgment on that and you have to work with your battle buddy or whoever's with you at that exact moment in order to make sure that that happens. Of course, you do need to, if we're calling alternate bounding, you need to at the very least move a little bit ahead of our position. You can't like stop there and then say, okay, well now we're set, because that just does not work. That's not how this, this formation works. But at the same time, don't get yourself into an unnecessarily unsafe situation just because you feel like you need to complete a bound. So just kind of keep that in mind. If, say, go ahead and bound past us, finish your bound. Team two. Team one moving. If our if our safe position is right here and we have cover right here, stay here. Call out set. Team one set. And then team two, you can bound. And then if there's no options, there's no options. But if there are options, try and use them as much as possible is all I'm getting at. Understood? All right. Now, can you tell me the difference between successive and alternate bounding? Which one is which? Successive bounding is the one where each bounding team stops at the position of the previous team. Alternate is more of the event past the previous team. Got it. Now, do you know why I would use... Actually, this is open to anybody. Say your name if you have the answer, but... Um, do you know why I would use alternate versus successive bounding? Max, uh, to provide covering fire for the next team that burns up. That's correct, but more specifically, alternate versus successive bounding. Alternate bounding gives you a lot more ground covered, but it's a lot less safe. Uh, you're covering a lot more ground, you're moving into unknown territory, you're sending team members sprinting into unknown, uh, quite frankly, uh, because the team is obviously not already set there. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot less safety with alternate, but a lot more ground is covered. Actually, exactly double the ground is covered when you're in an alternate bounding. With successive bounding, it's much slower, and it's going to be used based on threat assessment again. If the threat assessment tells me, hey, you know what, there's a 100% chance that there's going to be contact somewhere in this gap, I'm not going to use alternate bounding. But if you know you're trying to cover a lot of ground, or maybe you're on a time crunch, you can deploy alternate bounding in order to make sure that you get to where you need to get to on time. Now we're going to go ahead and switch this formation to live fire. Uh, the set team is going to engage the tower up there with a steady barrage of bullets. Steady, I say steady. Steady barrage of fire as the teams advance. You will call out major reloads and any jams. We're going to go ahead and initiate it with alternate bounding, northeast, five seconds. Team one set. Team two. Team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving out. Reloading. Reloading. Team two set. 
Last team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving. Mm -hmm. Team two set. Uh, team one moving. Team one moving. Cease fire, cease fire, about face. All right, we're going to do successive bounding this time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take up a five second position so you guys can bound to us. And again, That's you're going to be bounding to our position. Go ahead and make sure you're reloaded and ready to go. Uh, the target for this one is going to be the far barrel. We're going to be shooting at the far barrel, live fire. Make sure all silencers are off. All right, initiate bound in three, two, one, go. Team one set. Team two moving. Reloading. Nope. Two set. Good try. Restart. Successive bounding. You're bounding to our position. Yes. All right. Now team one. Team one moving. You guys are set. Team one set. Team two. Team two set. Team two, team one moving. Team one set. Team two moving. Team two set. Team one moving. Reloading. Team one set. Team two moving. Shoot. Set. Team one moving. Reloading. Team one set. Two moving. Team two set. Cease fire, cease fire. Alright, do you understand the formations? Yep. Got it. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. Go ahead and line on a uh, firing line on me, facing northeast, or excuse me, southeast, southeast. Get set up. Next formation we're gonna cover is the 91st peels. So we have a peel right, peel left. So peel right. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and initiate it, and you'll watch what happens. So as soon as somebody, I call peel right, the formation is gonna start peeling over to the right hand side. As soon as Moms gets about halfway is when so the the peeling man, as soon as he gets about halfway, the formation man on the far left hand side knows that it's his time to move. Go ahead and move and you move halfway. And you're gonna keep it going. And again, this one it requires good unit awareness and good awareness of your team. You got to just know that the guy is halfway and you got to take off. With a small group like this, there's obviously a lot of movement happening. With bigger groups, you have a lot more time set in order to uh, maintain your base of fire. All right, go ahead and switch it up. Peel left, peel left. All right, set men, go live fire. Seti barrage. Watch your spacing, everybody. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. Stop formation. All right. Do you see both of those, Max? Any questions on that? Uh, no. Got it. Now, with the next phase of this, uh, I'm going to identify what is the biggest benefit of both 
the bounding and the peeling formation. Anybody? Cheated. Uh, Jada. Jada, go. Uh, you gotta keep firing while while moving and uh, low risk. Exactly. So what it actually does, it allows the unit to reposition or move without any sort of real risk to the team um, from the enemy returning fire. So if we're able to suppress the enemy and keep them suppressed, at, on their end of this sort of a formation, on both occasions, it is a steady and constant barrage of fire. There's a non-stop stream of bullets, say like when we were engaging the tower. There's a non-stop stream of bullets hitting the tower while we're moving. And now the entire unit is able to even scaled all the way up to platoon size, again, these can all be extrapolated, even all the way up to the platoon size, we're able to bound up onto an enemy position with relative safety with any enemy positions being suppressed the entire time. And that can be hugely valuable. In addition to that, it allows us to ensure that we're not breaking, uh, breaking contact or breaking cover at any given time. So with a peel formation like that, we're able to reposition the unit. So say we're on top of a crest and I initiate a peel right as a team leader. It might be because there's enemies flanking us all around our right hand side and they're coming at us and they're pushing on that side. And we need to peel right in order to reposition the unit in order to get us in the way of those, those units that are moving. So even though we're suppressing a separate group, a second group is on the move and we're able to reposition the unit Thank you. Thanks to a uh, a strategic peel in that direction, blocking their action. So we're able to basically reposition the unit and do more with the unit while maintaining unit safety as much as possible. That's clear. All right. Any questions on this first phase? No. All right. Let's go ahead and head over to uh, the base over here, and we'll get l transported over to these. Uh, close combat area, the CQB area, and we'll do the rest of the CQB training there. <laughs>